Prime Minister started it already. The Prime Minister with his statements last night trying to still turn it into a political dispute rather than face up to reality that he's got to settle the industrial dispute before that plant will open here in Kinley. Because you see, it's time that we, the Federation of Labour with the full backing of the whole of the trade union movement, let the government know no longer are the threats of the regulations, all the regulations being brought down on us, scare us away from taking industrial action. No longer. massive industrial complex, processing logs from the vast man-made forests of the volcanic plateau. Kinleith is owned by New Zealand Forest Products, in 1980, the largest company in the country. Early that year, this was the scene of a strike that lasted for 12 weeks. The town that services Kinleith is Tokoroa. 30 years ago, it was a village. Now it has a cosmopolitan population of 19,000. Most of them depend on New Zealand forest products for their livelihood. Union organisation at the mill has built on past experience of struggle in the industry. In 1977, the timber workers' strike closed down the mill for three weeks. Support was massive, but there were weaknesses caused by poor communication, inadequate welfare provisions and a failure to involve the wives and families of strikers. At Kawero, a few months later, it was different. Workers at Tasman, the other major pulp and paper mill in the country, set up an efficient welfare network and sustained a six-week strike by basing their struggle more around the community. At Kinleith, over 3,000 workers are affiliated to 14 different unions. Biggest are the timber workers and the pulp and paper workers. Together, they make up nearly three quarters of the workforce. Just as important, although smaller in size, are the maintenance and service unions. Each of these unions functions independently, but a combined site delegates committee has been formed to coordinate union activity and negotiate common claims with management. The members of the site committee are rank and file delegates, not paid union officials. This is an unusual and progressive feature of the union structure at Kinley. In 1979, inflation and unemployment reached record levels. In a move against wage earners, the government under Prime Minister Muldoon passed the Remuneration Act. It gave government the power to interfere in the wage bargaining process. When this power was used to cut back on the driver's wages settlement, the Federation of Labour called for a nationwide one-day general strike. I don't think it makes much sense for thousands of workers to lose a day's pay on what really is a lost cause. This thing has been dealt with and it's not going to be changed. No, they can't afford to lose a day's pay like that. It doesn't make any sense. But what about Mr Knox's threat to repeat the 24-hour stoppage every time you personally interfere with free wage bargaining? Well, if he does that, we'll go back to wage regulations, quick and lively, and that's the decision of today's Cabinet.
In the teeth of government threats, workers at Kinley's began formulating their wage claim for 1980. They worked out that a 21% increase was needed for them to keep up their traditional parity with the Tasman workers. This would bring the core tradesman's rate up to 481.8 an hour. The workers knew that the government might intervene, but they felt strongly that their claim was logical and justified. The company was well able to pay the increase. It had just announced record production and a profit of $18.6 million for the first six months of the financial year. There was a setback, however. The pulp and paper workers withdrew from the combined committee and settled independently for an 18% rise. Despite this, the other unions were determined to pursue their original claim. At stop work meetings all over the site, the rank and file discussed the issues and were kept fully informed by their union representatives. With full support from the workers, formal discussions were held with the company in early December. Management, during the negotiations, uh, made various offers, some of which would have given the lower paid worker a lesser percentage than the tradesmen, but these were firmly rejected by the combined unions. Management, again, was somewhat arrogant in their suggestion that the officials did not have the support of the rank and file or the delegates, and after several days of negotiation, the negotiations eventually broke down. When the negotiations broke down, we got back to our membership immediately. We called a mass meeting in our number six paper store with our full advocacy there, and our membership unanimously decided to support the action taken by the delegates and to take direct action in support of our claims. The tactics adopted were, generally speaking, guerrilla-type tactics. We had rolling stoppages, we had uh, work restrictions on plant, we had uh, work to rule, uh, and these were all co coordinated by the side delegates committee. Forest products were visibly annoyed at this whole thing, but uh, didn't seem to be taking any sort of direct action on their own part. And so, we played silly buggers a little bit harder. We've been accused of doing that, so we decided to put the pressure on. The storm and alone put 14 black bands on the little area that they worked, and it was just virtually impossible for the company to operate. Despite all the action, the company were refusing to back down. Still probably believed that they, uh, Mr Butterworth never had the support of his membership. However, we kept at it until they were forced into the situation of deeming us to be on strike. On the 7th of January 1980, strike action by key maintenance unions finally brought production to a halt. The following day, at a mass meeting, workers overwhelmingly supported the actions taken by the site delegates committee. Further mass meetings were held frequently as workers dug in for the long battle ahead. I believe the company didn't know what they were taking on. They thought that we might go out for a couple of weeks, but they just didn't understand the resolve and the determination of the members, and they just didn't realise what was going to hit them. As the strike got underway, one of the first actions of the combined unions was to organise aid for those who were out of work. A hall in town became the welfare depot. An agreement was reached with supermarkets to accept food vouchers. Trips around the country were made to inform other workers about the struggle, to gather support and to collect supplies. We learned from Cowra, when the Cowra had their six week strike. And they told us that their problem was not getting enough people involved. Because the strike, you never know how long it's going to be. You know, we only thought it a couple of weeks for a start and then went on. The longer it went, the longer it went, the stronger we got. But of course, the biggest thing here was that we had the women involved. And without the women, you know, we wouldn't have a strike. When the men first started to come down here, they came by themselves. And then slowly we encouraged them to bring the children. 
because even if the wife didn't come, if she got the kids out of her hair for a couple of hours, and slowly the women started to come down, and those that we helped um, with groceries and this sort of thing when they really needed it, a lot of them were those that came back and helped us cook dinner and this sort of thing, because they wanted to help, and this, it was really terrific. Well, I didn't know a soul, and I walked, my husband kept saying, come on down, don't sit at home on your own. And I just walked in the door, and somebody jumped up and brought me a cup of tea. And next thing, everybody knew you. You walked around town, everyone was yeah. talking to you, and it was good. Came down every day after that. <laughs> and as the strike got on, of course, things got harder and harder, because you'd used up all your, your groceries in the cupboard then, and the women had to come out. And it's a terrible thing to have no milk money to put down when you've got four kids. But what they didn't realise, that were hundreds of other women like this, and to be able to come down here and just talk to somebody else with the same problem, you went home and it was no longer a problem. Just the friendly, outgoing atmosphere that was here. They'd walk in here and they'd bound to see somebody that they know because you'd think there was no one here till they opened that door and the place was full of people. <laughs> And the minute anyone who knew that person they'd walk up to them and say, oh, you know, how are you and all this, and there's a cup of tea, there was cups of tea coming through that slide like I've never seen it before, you know, it was <laughs> unreal. Cool. But mainly it was the atmosphere here. It was just so friendly and so open. It was open to everyone today. I think basically people who got vouchers for a family, they come in here, they get a, a food voucher, right? Now, depending on what was here, They'd usually get a bag of apples, a bag of onions, a bag of potatoes, there might be silver beet, there'd probably be fish, there'd be meat, there's untold stuff here. Now they'd get a bit of that, they'd walk, walk in here with nothing and walk out with arm loads of stuff, you know, a bit of each. And then they'd have to base their, their grocery voucher on what they didn't have, which it sometimes wasn't very much we didn't have, was it? We got, what was it, nine sharks, <laughs> was it nine? Nine sharks donated from Fokotani, and they were monsters. <laughs> So one of, our, one of our island boys here, he, we put shark in the, in the freezer, you see, and we're telling everybody it was half hooker. <laughs> they're, all, they're all on half hooker steaks, but it was shark. <laughs> Tasted all right. Oh, it was all right, yeah. Just food. Two, one. Nobody organised people to do things. They did it themselves. When a truckload of vegetables came in here, Nobody organised the workers to go and unload it. It just happened. People did it of their own volition. They didn't have to be told. What I'm saying is we didn't need bosses. We can do without them. <laughs> Meanwhile, solidarity between the diverse group of unions was being maintained by the site delegates committee. It backed up the action of the individual striking unions as it had done in the plumbers dispute several months earlier. And I think the plumbers there were the last to go out on strike. And for a very good reason. We'd only just finished a five-week strike. And we had to be sure that our guys were convinced before you could ask them to walk out the gate having just finished a strike like that. But at the same time, having done that and having the leadership with Butterworth and Page and Finlay there, other unions also knew that it was possible to beat this company. There were three groups in different situations. We had the timber workers who were suspended, we had the maintenance group who were on strike, plus the firemen and greasers, and we had uh, the pulp and paper workers who had made their separate deal. Now, the key to the whole situation, of course, was the maintenance workers, the maintenance unions. They were fully informed, they were well disciplined, and they were resolved. Now, irrespective of what happened, they uh, they intended to carry it through and get their claim. I felt that the timber workers, not being straight away involved in the dispute, because we told them to stay at work, uh, that created an additional pressure to us with our members. You know, they wanted to know why, and we had to explain to them why did we keep those timber workers working? Why are we telling them to work? We should all be out on strike, you know. But. Uh, the members, once it was explained, they accepted that situation where uh, they were supporting us and while they were working, uh, the dispute would carry on. The ultimate pressure, while it wasn't too obvious, it, it was coming all the time from the uh, timber workers, from their delegates and officials, 
And in retrospect, that's easy. They, they were the ones who called in the FOL, effectively, to try and take the um, whole proceedings out of the combined committee's hands and put it into the FOL's hands. But they totally misread the new leadership of the FOL. On the 29th of January, the New Zealand Timber Workers Union requested the Federation of Labour to intervene in the dispute. Immediately, President Jim Knox began discussions with union officials and delegates. You'd have to appreciate how Knox he must have felt when he first, the first meeting he came to in Rotorua, there was a swag of delegates. And uh, anyway, the delegates laid it right on the line. This is where we're going. This is what we're going to do. Uh, and more or less, you know, well, you fellas can please yourselves what you're going to do, but this is where we're going. So um, I suppose poor old Jim must have been a bit uh, confounded by the, the depth of feeling, you know, that people had. And uh, I'm not suggesting that Noxie would have done anything other than he did, but, uh, you know, there was a welter of... Uh, of opinion there that nobody could really override. Most of us didn't know much about him. We'd seen him on TV as a secretary of the FOL and he was that ugly faced fella who used to, <laughs> you know, he didn't come across very strong. And when he became president, a lot of us used to think, I wonder what sort of president he's going to be. But when he came here and he, you know, he'd get down the park there and he'd say, I'm with you all the way. And if you go down to pull the plate, I'll be there with you. And we're not going to give in. If this one's not settled satisfactory, then I'm afraid that the whole of the paper, pulp and paper mill industry could be in for some industrial upheaval. Knox was under colossal pressure by those people who wanted to see an end to it. And he's really the guy that I consider copped it in the neck. Uh, and there was a suggestion made at one stage that one or two of the officials just about had to sleep with him to keep them away from him. That's the sort of pressure he was under. I found a situation where officials, you know, were trying to put you off certain types of action. We're always referring to the history of strikes in New Zealand and uh, this, this is what happened in the YE strikes and this is what happened at the 1951 uh, Wharfie situation, you know. And I think it was uh, a tactic of certain officials to try and convince us that, you know, it just couldn't be done, you know. But it was obvious to the delegates and the way we'd manoeuvred it right from the start, I think we had the right approach. Amongst the strikers, morale was high. Tokoroa became a focal point for the nation. Politicians came to lend support and so did delegates from other job sites. There were social activities too. The combined unions organised a concert at which different cultural groups performed. I know I had a neighbour came in to me and she said, I don't know what you're all on about, she said. Muldoon's just told us that they're the highest paid workers in the country. And she said, my husband earns $7.30 an hour, so yours must be on about $10. And I got his pay slip and I said, he's on $3.90 an hour. Oh, she said. And she went home and brought me a jar of jam back. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, you know, I thought, oh. It was just such a shock because she couldn't believe because Muldoon told them our men were higher paid than anyone else. She believed. Yes, if it's yeah. written in the paper, people believe they it. They do believe they it. They just believe it. And <laughs> it's incredible what junk they print. Yeah, well, I could show it as paceless to prove, you know. That's how the news is edited. Yeah. The, the moment the company or the government or anybody put out something that was starting to spread around, we immediately put out counter propaganda to it. You know, and within the first, I think it was in the first 10 days, we had uh, Gestetner uh, in a garage operating, and we could get out 2,000 copies, you know, in a matter of a few hours, and then we spread them round. The company were doing it, you see, they had the advantage of a Franken machine, they just gave it to the post office. But we got ours out through workers and through 
uh, workers' families. Something that was really overcome to you was the fact that women actually got involved, not only in this distribution centre here, or the nerve centre as it was, but also they could sit down and talk to their husbands on the same level about any particular part of the strike. They could, they could quote figures exactly the same, there's pamphlets everywhere. That, that, that was the most important thing. Our husband goes to a meeting, what happened at the meeting? Oh blah, sits down, that's it, turns on the TV. Now they could come down here, they could talk about it. Everybody has their own little discussion, you know. And, they could, and the husband and wife could go home and actually have a decent discussion on something to do with their particular union. That was the important thing. And I think for the very first time, a lot of these, a lot of wives became involved, which is important. I mean, without the wife, let's face it, the husband has a hell of a hard job going to a meeting and saying, yes, we'll go on strike. Especially if he knows he's got a wife and three kids at home, we don't know a damn thing about it. And quite often, husbands are not prepared to sit down and explain to their wives about what happens at these meetings. Because half the time, some of them, some of them just don't know. Well, their husbands talk, but they didn't know what was going on. Yeah, well, you know, you know the way you hear about these things. Oh, it's a union meeting. You know, nobody can open their mouths. And people phoned me and actually said, they've got strong arm men at these meetings. And you can't speak and everyone shouts you down. And I said, well, I've been to them and I've never heard. I said, why don't you go and see what's happening? You know, well, they had such funny ideas, which I suppose I'd have had if I'd never been to one. <laughs> You'd have just yeah, believed what they right. told you instead of going and seeing for yourself. The strike had welded the community together in unshakable solidarity. It was this solidarity that finally caused the company to shift its position. On the 22nd of February, crucial negotiations took place. They've been at it all day and well into the night here on the eighth floor of the plush New Zealand Forest Products headquarters in Auckland, trying to solve a dispute which has cost this company $20 million, which has seen 530 men on strike for seven weeks and put a total of about 3,000 out of work. Gallons and gallons of coffee have been consumed while they've been battling it out here today and tonight, but it's understood that a settlement has just been reached. Some satisfactory progress has been made in negotiations today and Mr. Knox and I expect that details will be finalised at a further meeting which has been arranged uh, for Kinleith on Sunday afternoon. After we tie up all the other ends that's necessary to be tied up on Sunday afternoon, I will make a recommendation that I think that the workers will accept. After eight weeks of strike action, Forest Products finally agreed to the combined union's demand of 481.8, and it seemed victory had been won. But as soon as the settlement was signed, the government stepped in. Using the Remuneration Act, it issued regulations cutting the wage settlement back to what the company had offered in December, 469. It would overcome any suggestion that now the Auckland rate has got to be brought up to the forest industry rate. Uh, this is the reason why the government is intervening, uh, not a question of two and a half or three percent or not a question of wanting to be difficult or prolong a strike. Uh, we are stopping a wage, a further wage round that would go right through industry, first Auckland and then the rest of the country and thus a continuation. I am disturbed though of course that this seems to be a continuation of the Prime Minister's actions against the trade union movement that when wages are settled, and he believes they're too high, then he cuts them back or takes some other action. Well, today the workers have expressed their view about that, and they're not going back to work. The mass meeting of the 26th of February condemned the government intervention and called for the strike to continue. Well, I wish I knew where we went from here where we go from here because the uh, intervention of government has shifted the, uh, uh, the negotiations out of our courts to theirs. There is uh, evident uh, very strong resentment by the trade unions and the Federation of Labor and I hope that um, we'll have some more positive lead from government within the next few days. The implication is that you actually went to the government and asked them to interfere. Is that so? No, we did not. No, no. We have maintained a voluntary negotiating stance. Well, the attitude of the company, in fact, was 
oh, look what the government have done. We can't help that. They are the government. At the same time, forest products were applying pressure to the government to, to cut back the settlement that we'd made. We'd warned the company time and again to stop running to the government, that they would not resolve the problems, that they should negotiate directly with their union. We were representing their workforce and we would be the people that would settle the deal with them eventually. When do you think the men are going to get back to work? When do you think you're going to crack them? I don't have any uh, crystal ball that can you know, give me that sort of an answer as to when the men are going to go back to work. I just would hope they'll analyse their position down there very carefully. They've got a pretty generous wage offer in front of them and accept it. The problem people had to settle at 18%. We were only going for another 3.1% above that. And so people were saying, why? Why not settle for the pulp and paper deal? It's only 3% less than what you want. Why not buy that? Obviously, uh, the pressure was on us from the company, believing that they would break us, uh, to force us into 469. The government must have believed it also. And that's why they were, in, in, in most of the time, they were prepared to leave us out there, hoping that we would crack. So the only people who are going to crack is either the company or the workers, or it's the workers? We're not talking about people cracking, we're talking about people accepting a genuine, a genuine wage offer. And well, that's, but somebody's uh, got to give away. That's, uh, somebody's that's got that's to what, give away. That's what we're talking about, not people cracking or, or being pushed down or anything else. It's a pretty generous wage offer uh, that a lot of New Zealanders would have liked to have been uh, in receipt of this year. Uh, that's before the workers at Kinleath, and I think they should accept it. And when we weren't going to buy it because it was not correct. It was, it was below what was, would be happening at Tasman, as we predicted, and we weren't prepared to go any lower than Tasman. We hadn't done for the last nine years, so why should we go any lower now? And that's why we fought on for that last percentage, and that was very critical, that, as far as we're concerned, because if we'd have accepted a reduction then, it's a compound thing. What we were going, what were we going to accept the next year? Another 3% less. And this is where you're... you're we were already losing out on inflation and we'd be losing out again by the nature of our very negotiations. The FOL pledged full support to the strikers and issued a call for every unionist in the country to contribute an hour's pay weekly to the Kinleith Welfare Fund. The solidarity campaign was to be coordinated by the FOL and its affiliates. Requests for speakers came from job sites and trades councils all over the country. The site committee arranged for groups of workers to hit the road. Some of them were just apprentices, you know, just come out of their time, and they were into it. And um, overnight they become instant orators. You know, you threw them right in the deep end. And I can remember up in Otahu at the railway workshops, one of the first times I ever spoke on a loud speaker system. You know, and you're speaking away there, and all of a sudden just mind is blank. Nothing. <laughs> Just didn't know where I was, you know. And somebody I hear, uh, Butterworth or somebody at the back, and away you go again, you know. But people learn quick. When we first went out to Tasman and Graham Holmes was chairing the meeting, he wouldn't let any officials speak at all. It was just the people, the delegates from the job. And we was all, ah, uh, mm, mm, yeah. You know, we couldn't. So it's very, it's very hard to get used to. You can't, uh, you know, I was very nervous. We lost a bit of weight. When we went down to uh, Path here, run into a bit of a problem there. They were going to get the police if we come on the site. They were going to remove us, get the cops to throw us off. So the old mutton chain threatened to stop. So they uh, carried on there, you see, and we get into this meeting. And uh, the old official tells them that the uh, boys in blue were just about ready to throw these jokers off. They wanted to take a stoppage there and then straight off. There was talk down, we talked to those people and as some of these speakers said before about the overwhelming support that you do get from workers when you state your case. Well, this is another one there where jokers just stood up, clapped and money was just going on the tables, you know. We had a bit of organised for the engineers. We had it divided into four meetings for the day. Uh, well, every meeting that we went to, the stewards, shop stewards that were there, they got up and said, you know, how good the last meeting had been and how much they'd given, well let's double it. Come on, let's double it. And by course they did. We walked out of there with clean checks full of money, eh? You're rushing around looking for a bank, you know, <laughs> trying to get rid of this stuff, you know. Uh, what about a receipt? Never mind that, you know. And it was fantastic the the attitudes of these people, you know. 
A lot of people used to say we can never give in because of the amount of support we've had. You know, those people are counting on us winning. So there was never any thought of giving in. They were determined, but, uh, probably more determined than a lot of people here, that this would be one time that the government were going to get a real good clip around the ear of. Uh, and they were to come up and shake your hand and say, good stuff, boy. Make sure you don't buckle me. So it wasn't only a matter of Kinleys, it was a matter of going elsewhere and, and building up the movement in other areas. For the first time in New Zealand's history, the whole workforce from Kaitai down to the Bluff was organised and being organised by the FOL and its affiliates and the Trades Councils. And for the first time in our history, we've been working. And then when Muldoon saw that the whole country was starting to move behind the FOL, he was naked, wasn't he? Nothing he could do. The whole uh, outlook of the FOL is changed. It's a changed ball game. And this government has got something to think about. By the middle of March, the dispute was reaching a climax. The strikers remained strong, supported by donations to the welfare fund, finally totaling $630,000 from workers throughout the country. The government gave notice that it might give way, provided the unions throughout the forest industry were willing to make some concessions. But unless they're prepared to settle this dispute, then it will get extended. No doubt about that, it will be extended beyond the pulp and paper industry. On the 18th of March, officials and delegates met in Tokoroa to discuss the latest moves in negotiations. I do not agree with its husband or Caxton or Mampongaru agreements be set up as part of a bag, part of a deal. If we are to be involved, we'll get involved ourselves. And if the Minister then says, well, I'm going to bring down regulations to tie Tasman and Caxton, I would say that we'll have to deal with that problem when that happens to Tasman and Caxton, or rather the work of the Tasman and Caxton will then have to deal with that problem. So if we have to find some reasonably honourable basis of settlement, if it's going to be possible, and the 481.8 is agreed to, or even if it was 481.6, we wouldn't have to quibble over something as narrow as that if that becomes something that means something to the government. The wage movement does not keep pace with the inflationary movement since the 1970 era. We've got to face up to that. And the longer it goes, the deeper the shit we get. As a striking work. I won't accept anything like the lifting of the regulations. I feel that I'd be letting everybody who supported this strike all over the country down. And we can't do that. <coughs> to maintain the unity that was built throughout the trade union movement of this struggle, the only deal we can go for is the removal of the regulations, nothing else. We must receive the 481.8 and to receive that, he must lift the regulations. If he doesn't, there is no deal. Hard bargaining continued in the next few days. Eventually, the strike leaders reached a settlement with the government. The 481.8 would be paid, and regulations lifted, and the Remuneration Act repealed. For that, the workers had to agree that in the following year, the wage rise in the whole of the industry would be tied to the Metal Trades Award. On the 27th of March, after 12 weeks of struggle, Kinleith workers met to vote on the proposal. All those in favour, raise their right hand. All against. <laughs> Well, I've been in Togo 23 years, and it was a small town when I first came here, and everybody was close. And the town got bigger, and everybody went apart and went their own ways. But the strike brought us all back together. We found the community spirit, friendship, hospitality, 
we found real comradeship amongst ourselves. It was an experience I'd never, ever forget. It was a, an enjoyment and a pleasure to be involved in. Our tactics were a big lesson too. You know, we took out the tradesmen and then the, the company suspended, which meant they had an income coming. We allowed others to work so that they could supplement. I think the other thing is that while we don't underestimate the power of the mass media, Muldoon had that at his fingertips. He could go on TV or radio any time. We couldn't. But the fact still was that we got to talk to thousands and thousands upon workers throughout this country individually. And I know in my case, I spoke to a number of thousand in the meetings I went to, but I was conscious all the time that there were at least 20 other people doing exactly the same thing in other parts of the country. The biggest thing with the strike was that we, we got together with our men, most of us did, and we learned what it was all about. I learned, for one, what unions were all about, and I'd never known before. And to me, this was a big thing. I know next time that I won't, won't be spouting off, go back to work, go back to work. It's the first time I think a woman really knew what her husband's wage rate was, or what he was going to get, and they identified with it, didn't they? They, oh, yeah. they, they really stuck out for it. Apart from the uh, claim itself, I think the end result regarding government legislation against us and the point that not only us at Kinley learnt, but everyone in the whole country, that we could beat legislation. If you unite, of course you can bowl the government. And we're not talking about anarchy or anything like that, but a serious matter, such as uh, the government involved itself in an hour dispute, had to be bowled over. Otherwise, there's no future for anybody.